Big thank you to all my Producers Perspective Pro members and your Broadway Genius Meetup members who converged in a Midtown Watering Hole this past weekend for a big-time networking event. Fun was had by all. If you want to be involved in future networking events with us, join the ProducersPerspectivePro.com. Now, on with the podcast. I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I want to be... Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Producers Perspective Podcast. I'm very excited to have as my guest today, three-time Tony nominee, lyricist Glenn Slater. Welcome, Glenn. Hi. So Glenn was Tony nominated for his lyrics to School of Rock, Sister Act, and The Little Mermaid. Also wrote the lyrics to Leap of Faith, co-wrote the book, and wrote the lyrics for Love Never Dies, the Phantom sequel, which is hitting the road this year. Wrote the lyrics for one of the new big hits on Broadway this season, A Bronx Tale. So, Glenn, which came first, your love of writing or your love of the theater? I started out, actually, as a rock guy. I was in high school. I had a rock band with some older guys. I was desperately trying to write songs that we could play as a band, and they kept... I was the little guy. So they weren't interested at all in hearing what I had to do. And uh, about this time, the drama director at our high school was putting together a show that he meant to be sort of like a high school version of A Chorus Line where he got a bunch of kids into a room and interviewed them and had them write poems and monologues and just sort of got their perspective and wanted to turn them into songs and scenes uh, written by a high school student as well. And being frustrated with the band, I volunteered to write the music for the show. That show ended up being picked up by an off-Broadway producer and produced here in New York uh, when I was 17. So I kind of got bitten by the bug. When you're a junior in high school and Stephen Holden is reviewing your your show, it's sort of exciting, even though he slammed it. <laughs> he slammed. My first terrible review. A 17-year-old work he I, slammed? I, I, you know, I think the actual quote was, the music sounds like it was written by a high school student, which it was. <laughs> I, I call that a rave in my book, uh-huh, Glenn. Uh-huh. That's, that's amazing. So what was the show? Uh, it was called How I Survived High School, and uh, it ran at the Jan Hus Theater, which no longer exists, I don't think, but uh, it ran for about a year, I think. Do people still license it today? Is it in the catalog? I don't I'm not sure, actually. I have no idea. I'm one of those don't-look-back writers. I I almost never look back at anything I've done. I, Of all the shows we've done, I don't think I've ever listened to a cast album after we've recorded it. So uh, I'm, I'm always, what's the next thing? Really? No cast album? You don't listen? I, I have them. <laughs> I hear them when we do the mastering, and then that's the last time, usually. So. Do you go back to see your shows often? Not as much as I should. For the same philosophy the you're same, on to the next I'm thing. always on, yes, exactly. Do you think that's because you, are you a perfectionist? Oh, yeah. I don't know any writers who are perfectionists. I think for me, once once it's written and rehearsed and up on stage and in the arms of the public, it's no longer mine. It belongs to the actors and it belongs to the audiences. And all I can say are the things that I wanted to change but couldn't change, things that I should have known better and didn't know better. And it's just too much. So I, I let the actors do what they need to do, and I let the audiences enjoy what's there and try to get it the next time. So after your uh, off-Broadway debut as a 17-year-old, you were bit by the bug. So what? And you were a composer at the time. I you wrote the lyrics a, as well? I was a composer. Uh, I didn't do the lyrics. I just did music. I went to Harvard, and I wrote music for the Hasty Pudding Show there and a few other independent things. And then I came to New York with the idea that I was going to try to make it as a composer. And then I met actual composers. And I realized, oh my God, I so do not have what it takes to be a composer. What did they have that you did? Well, just, I think for for a Broadway composer in particular, just having a facility, an ability to do things quickly, and to hear something in your mind and get it out while it's still hot is sort of a, a very key skill. Every good composer I've worked with can take in a direction and execute it on a dime. And then if you say, no, it needs to be more, I need something bigger. Oh, like this? And they can just turn it, turn it right around and get it out of their, out of, from the idea to the keyboard very quickly. For me, if I had to do a key change, that was like an afternoon's project of trying to figure out, ah, uh, how do I get all the sharps? So I, I realized that if I wanted to write the sort of scores I wanted to write, I needed to find somebody who was more adept at the musical side and, just focus on words. And, and just like that, you're like, okay, I'm not going to write music anymore. I'm going to do this other extremely hard thing and write lyrics. Strangely enough. And honestly, I since then, I've 
maybe played the piano a handful of times. As I said, when I when I <laughs> when I walk in a direction, I don't look back usually. But uh, yeah, I um I had applied to the NYU program as a composer and had gotten sort of a similar response back from them, which was, uh, yeah, we don't think you're a composer, but we love your writing. If you want to reapply as a lyricist, you know, we'd love for you to do that. And so I had a week left in the deadline, so I just wrote lyrics as quickly as I could, not really knowing what I was doing. And I ended up not going to that program, but that sort of launched me into that, into the other direction. So where did you get your quote-unquote training as a lyricist if it wasn't at NYU? At the time, I was working at an ad agency doing copywriting, writing commercials and, and print ads. And the, my boss was a guy named Jim Patterson, who is now the James Patterson who writes all the mystery novels. But at the time, he was just an advertising executive. And he was, his whole thing was looking for people who work there who were not advertising people, who were creative, but hadn't been taught in the, taught the marketing language and were just bringing pure creativity to the job. And I came to him and I said, look, I, I, I think I want to pursue this other direction. And he said, don't leave this job. Go to the BMI workshop. You can do it at night. It's free. And you can do that while staying here. And those two places, the advertising agency and BMI, were sort of my, my school. BMI taught me the actual craft of lyric writing. And I don't know if your listeners know what, what the BMI workshop is, but it's sort of, it's been like the incubator for much of New York theater since the 60s. It was started by Lehman Engel, who was one of the preeminent orchestrators of the Broadway theater, and who had sort of looked at the, the body of Broadway scores and identified some key things about how they worked that they all had in common. Not a formula per se, but more like a, a sort of a, a way of looking at scores that boiled it down to its components. And it's from him that we get phrases like the I want song or the charm song. And the way the workshop works is that a lyricist or a composer gets paired with a their opposite number and you just sort of spend a month writing a song and then you get shuffled to a new co collaborator and try to do a new song. And after a year, you've worked with 10 or 12 different people and you've basically learned how to write a music. So while I was doing that, I was also working in advertising, which is all about have three ideas by noon. Oh, we don't like those ideas. Have another 10 ideas by midnight. Throw those out. Come up with another five ideas. Please this client. Make sure that this person feels satisfied. We only have, we have 10 seconds to do this and get the idea out in 10 seconds. So a very different sort of education in just quickness and adeptness and willingness to throw ideas on the table and willingness to trash ideas no matter how good they are and find new ideas quickly as you can. It is amazing. You are now, I think, the fourth writer that I've spoken to that is at least that has had a career in advertising or marketing before the theater. Rick Ellis, of course, mm -hmm. Joe DiPietro, I think, as mm -hmm. well, Lynn Ahrens, and now you. And they all talk about learning how to do things so quickly and succinctly. Yeah. And the, the skills are very similar. Writing a headline for an ad is very similar to coming up with a hook for a song, coming up with a you know, a slogan is not only coming up with the, the chorus of a song. So it's, you understand very quickly how to compress language and how to write language that will move and persuade somebody in as few words as you possibly can. And it's, the skills are very transferable. So, so what was your big break after? So you're studying, you're, you're working at BMI, you're working at this advertising agency with Jim Patterson. I mean, that's amazing. Uh -huh. And what was the first big crack that got you, that got you your start? I had been working with a composer named Steve Weiner, who has, he's written the Honeymooner show that's going to be coming to Broadway soon. And we had written uh, a show based on the, the movie Lost in America, the Apple Books one. And we, had brought it to the ASCAP workshop to present it, and it was a big hit there. And in the audience was somebody from the Disney organization who was looking for young talent. They had, at the moment, at that particular moment, a program where they were assigning young writers to properties that they were not necessarily going to make into animated films, but just to sort of see how do you work in their environment, how do you react to criticism, how do you do you think in animation terms? And they gave us a script called Marco Polo, written by a writer named Joss Whedon, who at that point was nobody, but who went on to become the guy who created Buffy the Vampire Slayer and does all the Avengers movies, Firefly. And it was written in his trademark style, which was very funny and very emotional. 
and we just glommed onto that script, which was fantastic, and wrote six songs in a few months. We gave it to the Disney people, who seemed to love it, and then we heard nothing. And while I was tapping my toes, waiting to hear something back, I thought, well, I need to, I need to do something to leverage this opportunity. So on a whim, I called, I found out who Alan Menken's manager was, and I called his manager and I said, listen, I just did this project for Disney. I got my foot in the door. I want to get my whole leg in the door. Can you help me? And uh, we met and he listened to some other stuff that I had done and he took me on as a client. And several months later, he said, well, something's come up. Alan had been working on another project there, which was a sequel to Roger Rabbit called Who Discovered Roger Rabbit. And he was working with the lyricist system. It wasn't quite working out. He had brought up my name to, his manager had brought up my name to Disney. He said, oh, we loved what he did for the Marco Polo thing. And he mentioned me to Alan and showed him some of my work. And Alan said, well, his work looks like a little bit like Howard Ashman's work. I'd love to meet him. And so they put, put us in a room together. And it was just one of those situations where we just clicked immediately. We just sort of spoke the same language and thought the same way. By the time I left his house that day, we had already written a song, and we were off and running. So let me just get this straight. You <laughs> did not know this manager before you called him. You mm-hmm. cold called him. Cold called. And you had a 17-year-old's production in New York that got slammed by Stephen Holden and really nothing else. That was it. Had never been produced before that. Completely unknown. So, yeah, I'm, I'm like the luckiest boy in the world, basically. <laughs> or you really took your future by the reins and, and made it happen for yourself, as I like to, <laughs> like to think of it. So I, I want to ask you about your process for writing a lyric, but one of the things I find extraordinary about your career is that you write with such a diverse group of composers and some pretty legendary composers. Alan Menken, you talk about being thrown in a room... I have this feeling that you're not dictating how the process is going to go when you haven't been produced and all of a sudden you're writing with Alan. Of course, you write with Andrew Lloyd Webber as well. So do you adapt your process for each person? How does that work when you negotiate the creative process with writers like this? Yes, I do adapt for each person. Usually when dealing with people who are at that sort of level of legendary, I don't even know how to describe it. I mean, Alan Macon and Andrew Lloyd Webber are fairly fairly huge, beyond huge, they already have a, a sort of a working pattern and you have to win their trust and you have to let them know that you're there to support them. But they also don't want just yes men in the room. They want pe- they want partners. They don't want underlings. So it's a, it's a fine line that you have to walk between asserting your own artistic voice and understanding what it is that they're looking for and finding ways to draw them out in ways that they might not necessarily have been drawn out before. To become legendary like that, you have to know what you're doing. Even if an Alan Macon or an Andrew Lloyd Webber has a bad idea, it usually comes from a place of experience and of wanting to try something that they haven't tried before and of trying to push themselves. And so a lot of what I do is sort of just acting as a sounding board and trying to figure out what it is they're going for. And once I find the kernel of it, helping them amplify it and get it on the right path. Okay, so we're going to flip this around a bit, because you are certainly on your way to legendary status. So we're going to imagine now that you are one of those guys, and that some fledgling composer that has never been produced before gets a hold of your manager and gets thrown in a room with you. How would you like, if you could say, this is how I like to work, Mm -hmm. what would you tell that composer? Okay, so that situation is actually in the process of happening, because I am looking for, for other writers to work with, and I'm looking for younger writers to work with. You know, I, I, um, I've I been working with two writers who have been sort of formulated in the 60s and 70s, and their voices very much in that era, uh, and I mean, majestic voices, but I'm also, I'd love to work with somebody with a more contemporary voice, so I've, I've actively started looking for people like that. And when we do meet and talk, the way I usually work is music first. I'll sit alone with a composer. We'll talk about the scene, about the idea for the show, about the arc for the characters and the arc for the themes of the show, and try to figure out how this particular moment sits within that context. And often I'll have a title or a phrase or some scrap of language that feels emblematic of that moment. And we'll sit at the keyboard, and uh, usually the composer will then just start riffing. Sometimes good ideas, sometimes bad ideas, it doesn't matter. It's just about getting stuff into the air. And 
when I start hearing something that feels like what I'm looking for, it feels like it's expressing emotionally what I'm hoping to express verbally. I say, that's it. Let's follow that thread. And I'll let the composer then follow that thread for a while. Keeping quiet, just letting them chase down the, the harmonies, figure out where the melody goes. Sometimes I'll contribute a, can you give me an, an extra few notes there? Or I, I'd like a longer phrase. Or what if we go high rather than low? Just helping shape the melody without actually putting my hands on it. And after a short while, we'll have an idea. We'll have a, a piece of music that feels like a completely smooth piece of music. I'll then go off and work with that and come back with a sort of a rough lyric. And then we'll start that again. Just here's the lyric. How does that sit in your melody? Do you need me to give you a few extra words? Do you need me to tighten this up? And we'll go back and forth until it's been polished a few times and then we'll let it sit. And then we'll come back to it in a couple of weeks and either hate it or love it or you never know. What attracts you to projects? Are you a person that thinks anything can be a musical if it's done well enough, or does it have to have some certain story elements if you're adapting something? I do think anything can be a musical. I don't think anybody can make anything a musical. I think you have to, I think you have to uh, have a, an insight into whatever it is in order to figure out what the musical is, which is why you'll have you know, three different teams look at the same material and one say, I don't see it, and the other say, well, I, what if we did this? And the third say, I know exactly what we're doing. I find usually there are two different kinds of writers. There are the kinds who are creators, who like to start from zero and come up with the story and the characters and something original and brand new, using some passion of theirs into it. And then there are the interpreters who like to take something that's already there and find the spin, find the thing within. I usually fall into that second category. I'm more of a of an interpreter than a creator. I don't personally have notebooks full of brilliant ideas to turn into musicals and say, this is, go this, is, this is where my heart is taking me. It's usually more looking at an idea that's already out there and saying, ah, I see how I can turn this into something. What's attractive to me is sometimes a musical style that I haven't worked in yet that I think would be fun to work in. Sometimes it's a political message or a, a theme that feels like something that just speaks to where my interests are at that moment. Often it's just a collaborator who I haven't worked with, and I'd like to do something with that person. Let's, let's take it out for a spin and see how it feels. But it's usually not one of those, for me, one of those burning, I must do this story. It's usually more of, this would be an interesting road to go down. Let's explore. You're such a shapeshifter of an artist in a way, your ability to work with all these different types of composers. But as I just think about the characters that you voiced or, or given voices to, so the kids in School of Rock, Little Mermaid and Disney, and then a Bronx Tale. So totally different characters. How do you find those unique voices? Do you do lots of research? I mean, you, were you up in the Bronx, like listening to a bunch of Italians on the street corner? What, what do you do? Um, I had been to the Bronx, but I did not have to go to the Bronx because the Bronx came to me. When you, when you work with Chaz Palminteri and Robert De Niro and uh, Tommy Mottola, it's like they are a walking encyclopedia of that place in that era. With Chaz... You know, I would ask a question, what kind of, what kind of car were you guys have driven back in that time? And so well, let me tell you a story. And two hours later, they're like, Oh my God, there were like four other musicals here <laughs> in that, in the answer to that question. But usually I do do research. I, I, I don't fill notebooks full of notes, but I do just find pieces of language in the research that feel emblematic. I do try to sort of get a beat on what the, um, the vocal inflections are, the patterns of speech, the rhythms of the speech. And I do try to sort of lose myself in it. I believe fairly strongly that if you are listening to the lyrics and hear the lyricist, you've done something wrong. I believe that the lyricist should disappear and you should feel like you were hearing the character speak. And often that means that I let go of rhymes that feel super clever because they call too much attention to themselves or phrases that feel too poetic I'll rough down because they don't feel like what that character would say. Often I'll purposely ruin the grammar, even though it hurts me. <laughs> as, a, as a writer to write something ungrammatical, that's how that character would talk, and that's what their lyrics need to be like. I know you don't like to look back, but I'm going to ask you one of my James Lipton questions, which is, 
I want you to imagine the Smithsonian Institute called you and said, Glenn, we have room for one of your lyrics in the Institute to oh, be God. preserved forever. Do you have a favorite lyric that you've written? Oh, I have a favorite lyric that I wrote. I don't know if I, if I can say that I have a single favorite lyric. If I had to pick one, I might pick The Life I Never Led from Sister Act, which I'm particularly proud of. There's a, a sort of a, a, an openness to it and a directness to it that, that I think hits the emotional moment very deeply while still having a sort of elegance to the language that feels like me. I, if I had to pick one project that I've done that feels most like me, I would say Gallivant, the TV series that I, that I did with Alan Macon. We wrote 60 songs in about three months, which is insane. And I, in order to get it all done, it was sort of the unfiltered me. Uh, I didn't have time to, to question myself or to uh, censor myself or to second guess anything I did. It was what's in my mind is going down on that paper and into the recording studio as quickly as possible. And when I listen to back on the rare occasions that I do listen back to what I've done, that's the thing that feels most like, yes, that's my, that's my natural voice without any varnish and without any trying to match an existing voice. Is there a song or a lyric out there that you so admire that you wish you written? Again, so many. You know, like every lyricist, I worship at the Sondheim Shrine, and I worship at the Frank Lesser Shrine. I, maybe Adelaide's Lament, that feels sort of like a, like a pretty, pretty nice one to, to hang your name on. What's the difference between working for independent producers like you are on Bronx Tale versus working for Disney or something like that? Do you find the, the corporate versus the independent atmosphere different? You know, I don't, actually. I, I know that people like to sort of look at Disney and say, oh, corporate theater, it's not like real theater. But the actual process of making theater with Disney is as intense and rigorous as it is anywhere else. They really, really care about the final product, and questions of marketing or audience don't even come into it until you're almost finished with the piece. When you're working with people as smart as, say, Tom Schumacher at Disney, it's all about the idea, it's all about the characters, it's all about getting it right. And I mean, we spent I don't know, eight years working on The Little Mermaid. There are probably, I would say, 40 or 50 songs in our trunk just for the half of the score that we had a right to match up for the other half of the score. Not because there was anything wrong with those songs, but because there was a vision that was a shared vision that needed to, everything needed to elevate to. And anything that didn't fit into that artistic paradigm had to go. And exactly as it would be on a, on any other Broadway show or at a, at a, at a nonprofit theater, by ruthless about getting the artistic integrity to where it needs to be. Of all the shows that you've done, speaking of trunk songs and cut songs and added songs, of all the shows that you've worked on, what's the one that's had the most intense preview period of changes? Uh, again, so many. I mean, the one that's coming immediately to mind from the movie Tangled, there's a song called uh, When Will My Life Begin, which went through so many permutations. I think we did 50 or 60 versions of it. It started out in a very sort of Joni Mitchell folk kind of a way with a very convoluted lyric and a completely different idea. And as we kept working on it, the beginning of the film kept changing and the idea of Rapunzel's character kept changing. And every time that, that character changed even a slight bit, the lyric would have to go out and we'd have to come up with a new one. We started with a certain piece of music that, as I said, felt very Joni Mitchell. We sort of detoured to different ideas that used other styles of music and other feels. There were sad versions, there were upbeat versions, there were... And then finally, we came back around looking for an idea to match a new version of the character, and somebody said, well, why don't we go back to that first Joni Mitchell feel, but give it a more upbeat pop rock sort of drive to it. And so we went back to that original piece of music. I had to strip out the entire lyric and put in a whole new lyric with a whole new title. And then that version went through so many uh, just nips and tucks and changes and fixes and ins and outs, getting to match up with what was happening on the screen. Uh, 60 versions later, we ended up where we are. And I looked back at some of where we went and was like, wow, <laughs> what were we even thinking at that point? But, you know, it's it's when you have that many smart people in a room, eventually you end up where you should be. Do you enjoy the process of writing for movies? Oh, love than it. You do? Love it, love it. 
What's the big difference between writing for a movie and a stage show? When you're writing for a film, well, there's a difference between writing for a Disney film, let's say, and writing for an independent film or a non-Disney film. When you're writing for, say, something like Tangled, you're working with the best of the best. And their process is, it's, it's not like you're three writers in a room working on a show the way you are on a musical. You have, the, as a resource, everybody who's ever written a Disney animated film sort of helping you along the way, which on the one hand can sound oppressive, but on the other hand, if you're running into a story problem, they'll have a meeting with their, the 50 people who have written or directed or helped drive forward the last 20 years of animated films, all of whom have amazing insights. And you'll sit in that room knocking ideas around until you come up with the thing that actually feels unexpected and fresh and different. And then that's what you can win with. It's a, an unbelievable resource to have. On a different kind of a film, on let's say Sausage Party, which Alan and I wrote the big opening number for, it's the exact opposite. You're working with people who don't have a lot of experience and who don't really know what, what they want. And there it's a, sort of a different kind of freedom because you're working with no rules. There's no set pattern. They don't really know what they're looking for. You can try anything, and they're willing to go with anything. Often, they'll have ideas of their own that you hear them, and, you're, and you say to yourself, well, that's not proper musical theater practice. And yet, that can also be refreshing, because you don't feel locked into what you've always done. You're getting feedback from people who are willing to break the rules because they don't know what the rules are. And often, you end up with something that feels brand new out of that process, too. I'm fascinated by this Disney think tank idea, if you will. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a model for that in the theater? Do you think there's some way to, oh, we're having trouble with developing a show. Let's get the Lin-Manuel Miranda in one room and Tom Kitt and, the, you know, and have, have everyone come together and Janine Tesori and figure all this out? Um, you know, theoretically it could work. I think that one of the things that differentiates theater from film is that theater is usually an author-driven process and there's a lot of I don't want to say ego, because that makes it sound like a bad thing, but there's a lot of the self invested in the writing of a music. In a film, it's much more of a collective experience, and so you have less of yourself invested, and everybody is more willing to be part of a big machine. So I'm not sure if that model would necessarily transfer directly to theater, but certainly I think having other voices in the room is a good thing to have. And you know, most writers I know have a circle of people who write, who they trust, and who who they have like an easy flow of ideas with, and they'll bring them in to see an early version of the show, to, to see a workshop or a read through, just to get feedback. And it's sort of a similar sort of a process. I'm uh, reading a book right now called Originals, and in it they talk about how peer to peer feedback beats market mm -hmm. research feedback all the time. Yeah, and I would say even with getting group feedback from an audience, when you do the marketing questions and specific like focus group feedback, you get audiences thinking that they need to sound intelligent or explain themselves. And what you end up with is a twisted version of what they're actually thinking. You get a lot more just sitting in the room with them and seeing where are they leaning forward? Where do they feel like they're tuning out? Where do they laugh? Where do they not laugh? There's a wisdom in crowds that isn't a verbal wisdom necessarily. It's just sort of a body feel that you need to be there, and you can feel it. It's it's And it speaks very eloquently. What's next for you? The very next thing is a show called Beatsville, which I've written with my wife, Wendy Lee Wilf, who is the composer and lyricist. On this one, I'm just writing the script. It's a beatnik jazz show based on a cult movie called A Bucket of Blood by Roger Corman, a black comedy set in the beatnik era. And Wendy has written a sort of bebop vocalese jazz score that sounds like Nothing you've ever heard. It's sort of like the the jazz equivalent of hip hop, I guess, and it's twists and turns and tightness of rhymes. Something I could never do. And we're bringing it to the Oslo Rep down in Sarasota in in May of this year, and then after that, it's going to the Fifth Avenue in Seattle, and then hopefully beyond. Okay, my last question, my other James Lipton question, which is my genie question. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you and thanks you for giving voice to another member of the Disney family, the Little Mermaid, and all the contributions you've made to Broadway. And the genie says, Glenn, I'm going to grant you one wish. 
What's the one thing that drives you so crazy about Broadway that gets you angry, frustrated? We've already talked about you're such a nice and gentle guy. You can work with all these different legends in the industry. Obviously, a credit to your amiable personality. What gets you pissed off that you'd ask this genie to wish away? All right, again, pissed off, such a strong word. But I think like many writers, I do wish there was a way to do Broadway shows that was less expensive than the current model. Both because it just the, the stakes are so high that it does sort of choke off a bit of creativity. It does sort of limit what you can do in a Broadway context. And it keeps out a lot of audience members who could be part of this community. If there was some way where shows could, could be done for one to two million dollars rather than twelve to fifteen million dollars, it would really change the face of what this art form is. And, you know, I, I know that it's not possible, but if the genie can come and somehow make it so, I, I think that I personally would be doing things that are a lot more outlandish and experimental and out on the edge. I think a lot of people, a lot of writers would be, would feel freed to do that. And I think audiences would, because they would have to invest less to be there, would be willing to experiment more and to try things that were fresher and newer and different. So... Bring the genie. <laughs> well, thank you for that. While we may not be able to cut them in half, we, there's a ton that we can do to keep this thing from increasing at the rate it is. So thank you for that. Thank you for joining us. Thanks to all of you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you next time. Don't forget to check out the Producers Perspective Pro.com to be invited to our future networking events. we got a fun one coming up soon. Check it out at the Producers Perspective Pro.com. Oh!